When I was a young lad, I heard one of the experienced and revered pastors saying that the reason we Adventists don't smoke is that if God wanted us to smoke, he would create us with a chimney on top of our heads. Obviously, my mother liked the answer so much that she quoted it in our children's Sabbath school a few times. On another occasion, my brother, who unlike me has a musical talent and was attending an evening music school, asked about why Adventists don't dance. And the same revered, experienced pastor said, just look at the people at the dancing floor. If you, if you put your fingers into your ears and look at them, they must look like crazy to you. To which he quickly replied, if you look at Philharmonic Orchestra playing uh, classical music and you put fingers into your ears, they must look like crazy to you. It was not appreciated, of course. So. <laughs> About 2005, when I was a new, new boy teaching theology, and my mother still had her marbles together, and I was visiting her back in Slovakia, I remembered the story, and I said to her, you know, Mom, if I told my students what you taught us, they would laugh at me. And she said, you know, Daniel, the world then was a much simpler world. Yes, the world in which Adventism developed its mission and identity was a much simpler world than you and I live today. And the answers that satisfied people in 1930s or 1870s are not going to satisfy the generation Z or Z, if you are from America, today. And as Sigve Tonstad would like to say, quoting, uh, or it used to be very clear why we are here, but after 170 years, can you believe on 22nd of October, it will be 175 years after the great disappointment, it is not so clear. And so, as a Sigve Tonstad would say, quoting American diplomat and professor, where you stand depends on where you sit. And the early Adventists are sitting in Battle Creek and in 19th century world. And everything was clear and simple. If you only preach the three angels' messages to those Americans, every kindred, nation, tongue, and people will hear the gospel and Jesus can come. Because God in his providence made sure that people from all kindred, nation, tongue, and people are there in America. And then came 1874, and they sent out the first Adventist missionary to the land of John Calvin, because they discovered there is a world outside of America. And then it came 1888, there is a time to rethink Adventist theology and the identity in Adventism. And you remember the big discussions. That's not our job to preach righteousness by faith. Our identity is different until Alan White has to say, no, righteousness by faith is three angels' messages in verity. And then came 1901, and you have to rethink again, this time the structure and to reorganize for mission. And then comes the 1915, July, when the founding mother dies, and the Bible conference of 1919, when you have to deal with this new reality. How do you deal with your own tales and myths? Because by then it's clear that we have our own tradition and myths and tales. And Adventism decides that perpetuating our own story is more important than the facts. Now it's not a good time to deal with it. And then 
Adventism has to confront the fa fascist story. And if you read the works of Daniel Heinz or John Johann Hartlap or Jacques Ducan, you discover actually we didn't do that well because of our understanding of identity. We were looking for the beast and we didn't realize that the beast came from elsewhere. And then came 1964. And in 1964, until then, you could always say, just as Noah preached for 120 years, and then the end came, we are going to preach the soon coming of Jesus, and then one day it's going to happen. But in 1964, it was 120 years since the great disappointment. And the question is, how long can you cry, wolf, wolf, and still be taken seriously? And Adventism has to deal with this. And so in 1966, at the GC session in Detroit, Robert Pearson is elected as the GC president, coming back as a division president from India, and before that, as a division president, he served in Africa. And he discovers, coming back to America of 1966, it's a very different America that he left in 40s to go to the mission field. And there is the word hippies and sexual revolution and he slams the brakes and after go 70 anybody here still remember go 70 go 71 at the annual council of 72 they say we are putting the agenda aside and we are going to pray until the revival and reformation comes <coughs> If you remember, 1,000 days of reaping, harvest, 90. Then comes 1989, and Adventism confronting the communist story. And it's in a triumph. There is over 90,000 believers in the USSR, over 50,000 believers in Romania. Talking about my own country, Czechoslovakia. When the communists took over the power in 1948, we had about 4,000 Adventists in Czechoslovakia. In 1989, at the fall of communism, we had 8,000. In 40 years of communist, difficult circumstances under communism, the church grew up 100%. But also, you have true and faithful Adventists in the Soviet Union. You have the Kerak split in Hungary. But overall, the ideas of communism didn't go well. And the ideas of Adventist identity defeated them. Then comes the global, the GC session in Indianapolis in 1990, and Adventism realizes that just because you've got one Adventist or one Adventist family in a country, that doesn't tick it off from the reached, at least of rich countries. And the global mission is born. And we are not going to think about finishing the work and our identity in terms of taking the flag from the platform and say, yep, I'm going there and preach. And if we have one believer, we have reached that country, we can take it off. And then comes the genocide in Rwanda. And Adventism realizes that orthodox fundamental beliefs are not enough to hold us together. That one type of Adventists are going to kill another type of Adventists, although they hold the same 27 fundamental beliefs. But the tribal identity is stronger than their theological identity. And then after 2015, San Antonio, we realize that we are dealing with complex realities of a polarized church. Dealing with the realities of the first world, it's Adventist identity, it's not a simple answer. It's not a simple question. Adventism worked well with a shortness of time mentality. Let's pull out our sleeves and do it for the Lord, because if we don't, who else would do it for the Lord? He doesn't have anyone but us. We had a lot to say about the work of the Holy Spirit in us, sanctification. 
the work of the Holy Spirit through us, mission, but somehow we were quite oblivious to the work of the Holy Spirit around us. Adventism worked well with the 19th century mentality. Wherever around the world Adventism came and encountered 19th century mentality, it did well. And does well till today. The closer the mentality is to 19th century American Midwest, Adventism is going from triumph to triumph. But go to contemporary Sweden, go to the Netherlands, go to Orthodox countries, and Adventism is struggling big time. Have you heard the name Edward Snowden? Edward Snowden was a young American, he's a young American lad who made public things which the American government was not happy about, and ever since he's hiding somewhere in Russia, nobody knows where. I hope I am not an Ad Adventist Edward Snowden if I tell you. Adventism is struggling with its identity big time. Somehow, what worked well in an era of optimism has hard time to function in the era of disillusionment. When the end of history has been delayed, postponed. And there is no surprise that there are voices questioning the Adventist story, Adventist identity, plethora of voices, how to make Adventism great again. And there are always those who just say, no problem, just do it. Just preach it. The apocalypse is upon us. But that assumes that you know exactly where the world is going. But you don't. The truth is you don't understand what's going on in the world. And that way of crying louder is just a way to deal with your fear, with your panic. Those of us who attended the European Theology Teachers Convention in late April in Cologne will remember the presentation of Michel Grandjean from the University of Geneva. Until yesterday, for me, that was the best thing I have heard in 2019, a world specialist on Calvin, explaining to us the understanding of pastoral ministry in the works of John Calvin. But what was so memorable about his lecture was that he showed that you are not going to understand the genius of Calvin unless you understand the world into which Calvin came. Or to put it negatively, you are going to misunderstand John Calvin if you don't understand the world into which he came. And I was thinking, hmm, why don't we put more emphasis on understanding the world into which Adventism came? Because you are going to misunderstand the Adventist identity if you don't understand the world into which Adventism was born in the 19th century. And then you hear these panic voices that, you know, they changed the hymnal, we have lost our identity. You know, they brought in the drums, and we don't have our identity anymore. Or, now the women can come to church in their trousers, where is the Adventist identity? Really? To understand Adventism and Adventist identity, you have to understand the world into which Adventism was born. And so let me tell you that in early 18th century, a movement sweeps across Europe saying, now what the pope, what the priest, what the teacher, what the parent, what the boss says is not going to be the source of authority anymore. We are not going to listen to someone in the position of authority just because they have a position of authority. From now on, beliefs must be based on reason. We are only going to believe things which are rational, which are logical. 
reasonable. And the interesting thing about this approach is that they genuinely believe if everyone applies the correct principles of reason, all will come to the same conclusion. You still hear it in the Sabbath school on a folklore level. Just go to any Sabbath school, and you will see it on a Sabbath morning during that Sabbath school hour. Somebody will stand up and say, yes, but the spirit of prophecy says, and they give you the quotation and sit down. And I feel like say, yeah, of course, I know that quotation. I have read that quotation. Now, could you tell me which one of the three possible interpretations you espouse and why? Why did you end up with that interpretation? You don't learn that. And most of them never thought about it because they believe by quoting an inspired statement, the meaning is self-evident. And all sincere souls will come to the same conclusion. And this brings a great crisis of identity into the medieval Europe. Because before that it was very clear. God is up there, we are down here. And if we are good, God rewards us. If we are bad, God punishes us. Everything is clear. Until that... So, you take the authority, and that's how you explain the society. Medieval European society, so that we don't land on Catholics. And everything was clear until that Saturday morning. First of November 1755, when at 9.40 in the morning, an earthquake struck the capital of Portugal. And out of estimated 275,000 people living in Lisbon in those days, between 60 to 90,000 people died. Now, however tragic is when 60 to 90,000 people die, historians are not entirely sure how many. This is not the greatest earthquake ever struck mankind. There have been earthquakes there where 600,000 people died. There was an earthquake in China where 900,000 people died. But why this earthquake made such an impact on how humanity thinks? If you are from a Catholic country and you look at the date, you discover that it's an All Saints Day. And because Portugal is a Catholic country, on that day, everybody at 940 was either in the church at the early mass or going out of the church or going into the church for the second mass. And the result was that the majority of people who died in Lisbon earthquake died in cathedrals. Because to be in a Gothic cathedral when the earthquake strikes, it's not the best idea. If God is punishing the sinners, he obviously didn't know where the sinners were. Unless you are a staunch anti-Catholic and you believe that they deserved it. And as a result of that, the world was never the same again. After a Lisbon earthquake, people no longer are going to believe that earthquakes are a punishment from an angry God. And so in sciences, it's a start of seismology. From now on, you are going to explain earthquakes as a movement of tectonic plates. And in theology, deism starts, and you are going to explain, yeah, the world, the God is the creator, but he is a distant land owner. He doesn't run the world. And then you come to a Baptist farmer, William Miller, who by the time he's an adult, he becomes a deist. He espouses these ideas of a distant God not involved in the world. Until he goes into the war with Britain, and he lives in the time where science, technology, and the new era of discoveries, remember? The era of great optimism. Now the golden age of humankind is ahead of us until he goes into the war with British and there especially 
in the Battle of Plattsburgh, he experienced something he cannot explain with his dazed worldview. You know, somebody said, in trenches there are no atheists. And so he sees his fellow soldiers praying, and some of them are saved and some of them died. And at the Battle of Plattsburgh, it's in New York State, in 1814, he sees how the smaller group of Americans with inferior weapons defeat a larger army of British with much better weapons. And he, with his operating system, with his mindset, cannot explain how it happened, except for one way. God must have wanted that. But that is incompatible with his worldview. And so he comes back home, and he needs to do a rethinking. And when he goes back into the Bible, he discovers that the world is not going to get better, and we are not going to have a golden age of humanity ahead of us. There is a catastrophe around the corner, because the Bible says that Jesus is going to come, and that will be the end of history. And the rest is history. After carefully studying the prophecies for many years, now the identity is going to be clear. Why are we here? To preach the soon coming of Jesus. And after Samuel Snow helps them, then it's clear it's going to happen on 22nd of October, 1844. And they lived happily ever after in the clear identity until that Wednesday, Tuesday midnight, 23rd of October, when Wednesday started. And they go through a great disappointment. So, enlightenment started as a rethinking of medieval European worldview. Deism started as a rethinking of enlightenment. Millerism is a rethinking of deism. And Seventh-day Adventism is a rethinking of, method, of uh, Millerism. After the great disappointment, they need to do this great rethinking. Why are we here? Was there anything good in Miller's movement? What does it mean to be the remnant? Because we, there was something good about it that should not be thrown out. Every rethinking brings some new positive results, but because we have no perfect understanding in a fallen world, it also creates some confusion. When people pointed out to Miller that the Bible says nobody knows the day and the hour, he says, yeah, but you can know the year. Now, you can think whatever you want about Miller, but he was a genius. 19th century Protestantism was all, all post-millennial. Today, post-millennialism basically does not exist. He changed the world. But you have to do rethinking. The ways, there are 15 ways how he calculated 1844. 14 of them are laughable. The 15th one we still use today. But the, you look at the other 14, 14 of them, and you say, oh, really? In the words of the famous theologian John McEnroe, you can't be serious. <laughs> and because we don't have a perfect understanding, you always need a new rethinking to sort out the mess that the rethinking creates. And so Adventism is born out of this rethinking. What is the result? Adventism does rethinking in 1844, and then they pre lived happily ever after as long as we preach our testing truths, Jesus will come in no time. 
And who is going to survive? Those who preach and practice the testing truth. And the eschatology becomes the driving force of the system of Adventist theology. Until they gather in that memorable meeting in Minneapolis in October 1888 and make a mistake of inviting someone who is young, educated, and from California. And every time you invite someone who is young, educated, and from the different part of the tracks, there is some rethinking and reshaping taking place. And Adventism has to do a great rethinking in 1888. And they discover that righteousness by faith. You don't survive the investigative judgment by our performance, back to Jan Barna yesterday, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, done 2,000 years ago for us, on our behalf, and without us. If you want to contribute to your salvation, you just have been born 2,000 years late. It was all decided on Good Friday, A.D. 31. And they lived happily ever after. True? From now on, a new type of soteriology is going to drive the Adventist system. Until one day, Thomas Unruh, driving back from his preaching appointment, will listen to the lectures on Romans that Dr. Donald Barnhouse was preaching. And he was so blessed, his heart was strangely warmed, that he writes to Barnhouse and says, Dear Dr. Barnhouse, I am so happy for people like you who preach the message of righteousness by faith with its clarity. May God bless your ministry. Signed, Thomas Unruh, East Pennsylvania Conference President, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Barnhouse writes back, Dear Brother Unruh, I am surprised that you as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor like my explanation of Romans because we know Adventists don't believe in righteousness by faith. So Unruh writes back, this is a big misunderstanding. Of course we believe in righteousness by faith. We are Protestants. And Barnhouse writes back, of course you don't. When I grew up in Baltimore, we had Adventist kids playing with us. They were legalists. They knew nothing about righteousness by faith. And so Thomas Unruh, because from Pennsylvania is not far to Tacoma Park, brings this correspondence to the GC headquarters and says, look, we have been around in this country for almost 100 years, and people have no clue who we are. They think we are some kind of sect. They have no idea we are Protestants who believe in righteousness by faith. And the rest is history. Because at that time, Zondervan, a Protestant publishing house, commissioned Walter Martin to write a book on American sects. And that being a researcher, he decided, I'm going to ask people some questions. So he went to Boston to the headquarters of Christian Science and said, I would like to ask you a few questions. And they slammed the door at his face. So he went to Brooklyn to the headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I have a few questions that I would like to ask you. Because I am writing this book on American sects. He already had an author commissioned who put a big octopus on the cover with seven tentacles. Christian science, Jehovah's Witnesses, some of the Adventists, Mormons. And they slammed the door into his face. So he goes to Tacoma Park. And because of this correspondence, they open the door and say, what are your questions? And as a result of that, in 1957, a book, Questions on Doctrine, is published. Probably the most theological explanation of what Adventists believe. But of course, because M.L. Andreessen was not invited to be part of the group, there is still a discussion where the Holy Spirit descended on him mightily or a little demon jumped into his soul. He started to write his letters to the churches. And the world of Adventism was never the same again. And from then on, you have those who say, you know what's the solution for the current crisis of Adventist identity? You just have to return back. 
Oh, the discussions with evangelicals, they are the reason. The brethren betrayed us. Oh, you just, have you heard about 1888 message? You just need to go back. The, war, the message that the doctor brought was the message from heaven. You just need to return back. Why there is this surge of problems with Trinity in contemporary Adventism? Because the solution for the crisis of identity in a complex world which is so different from 19th century, it's very simple. Whether it's Brexit, whether it's making America great again, whether it's just accept the non-Trinitarian views of pioneers, the solution is always very simple. Just go back. Just let me say one thing. The Bible starts in the garden, but ends in a city. Because even God cannot go back. You have to go forward. And of course, then there are those who don't know much about Adventist theology and what is the contribution of Adventism. But they like the music. They like the pastor. They have their friends going to the Adventist church. And so they are cultural Adventists. And then you have those who say, depending on the administration, 777. Just pray at 7 a.m., 7 p.m. for seven days a week. Pay, pray, and obey, and we will get you to the other side. Or don't rock the boat. We will get there. And then there are those who say, in every time, God's people had to change something. Let's not change too much. Do you know what brought down East Germany? Too many changes over a short period of time. You change too much, it creates instability. So let's change something, but not too much. And then there are those who say, in today's world, the time has come not to emphasize what we have different from other Christians, because there are people who couldn't care less whether you are Catholic, a Protestant, or Adventist. They are going to put explosives on their belt and it's time has come to emphasize what we have in common with other Adventists. Now, here's the thing. I don't know where you see yourself your local church, your geographical part of the world. But these groups are here to stay until the second coming. The fact that you don't like it is not going to make them disappear. And the tragedy of contemporary Adventism is that we spend most of our money, effort, and energy on converting other types of Adventism into my type of Adventism. Because that's the one that Jesus approves. <laughs> Sigwe, you are always welcome. The question of 2019 in Europe. Yeah? So then you have an independent ministry who will come to Sweden and say, gospel preach for the first time in Sweden. Really? I thought they have been Lutheran for the last 500 years. The question is, can we find an umbrella where these types can live together? Or are we going to fight one another until only the two of us remain? And on a good day, I will have doubts about your sincerity if you don't see it like me. What is the identity in Adventism? I humbly suggest that you need to go back to the Bible. What is the identity in the New Testament? And one day, Jesus takes these Jewish boys out of their comfort zone in a Galilean village to Caesarea Philippi, up north in the Gentile region, 
to a pilgrim place where people come to worship the pan god, the goat god. And then he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And they thought this is just a team meeting to assess how the ministry is going. And say, yeah, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What about you, Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, son, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Do you see the question that Jesus is asking? It's not the question that you and I would ask. When I used to be a teacher at Newbold or in Sazava, in Czech Republic or Zaugsky with Arthur and Galina working there together. I might ask, so what do students say about my teaching? Do they laugh about my jokes? At my jokes? But Jesus doesn't ask, so what do people say about my parables? Robert Johnston, a professor of New Testament now retired from Andrews University, wrote an intriguing book they also spoke in parables, comparing the parables of first century rabbis in Second Temple Judaism with the parables of Jesus. But Jesus does ask, so what do people say about my teachings? What do they say about my parables? What does he ask? What do they say about me, about my identity? Who is Jesus? And you know why is that significant? Because in Christianity, the person of Jesus precedes the doctrines of Jesus. To be a Marxist means that you believe that the Marxist explanation of history is what moves the society forward. To be a Muslim means to believe that there is one God, Allah, and Muslim, and Muhammad is his prophet. But to be a Christian is not enough to believe in the teachings of Jesus. Now notice carefully, I did not say that the person of Jesus is more important than the doctrines of Jesus. Because if I said that, some of you say, oh, that means the doctrines are not important. I didn't say that. I just said the person of Jesus precedes the doctrines of Jesus because the doctrines of Jesus are important because of who Jesus is. The role of the doctrine is to deepen my relationship with Jesus, to make it more practical, more livable, to make me a more loving, gracious, and tolerant person. If the doctrines do not make you a better person, what's the point? And the first world, post-enlightenment, secular, post-truth, reminds us, who cares about your doctrines? And in that sense, doctrines are important. Now, some people manage to love God even though they believe in eternally burning hell. Now, you have to do some mental gymnastics to do that. Some people manage. But the essence of Christianity is a relationship with Jesus. And if Adventism is part of Christianity, then I humbly suggest to you the essence of Adventism must be Jesus. Or to quote Dan Jackson, since when it's a crime in Adventism to speak about Jesus. Of course, the Matthew 16, it's a dividing line between Catholicism and Protestantism. But Jesus says, you are Simon, son of Jonah, but because what he was revealed to you, you become Peter the rock. Or to shorten it, Johnson plus Christ becomes rock. But when you ask, how did Peter understand this, and you look into his epistle, you discover that Peter says, Jesus used plural. 
This was not about me. This is about anyone. Anyone who accepts this revelation about God, about Christ, becomes the living stone. And so Peter believes that all of us, if we accept the revelation of Christ, we become the living stones. We become a new type of community. Remember that he quotes Exodus 19? You are a special type of community, God's exquisite possession. Priests and kings, kingly priests. And so here we are in the first world, 21st century Europe, America, in Australia. Traditionally, religion provided three types, solutions for three types of problems. Problems that we could call technical. How do you produce enough food for all to survive? And if somebody gets sick, how do you heal them? And if you have this problem, most people will go make, if you are sick, you make a pilgrimage to a temple rather to a hospital. When drought and locusts destroy your harvest, you turn to priests to intercede with gods. But enlightenment brought an end to that because if somebody tells you that to produce corn, you have to do, pray before you put the seed, then you need to do this, and then you need to do that, and somebody else produces better results without doing all that, you cannot survive. Why? Because it's evidence-based. And so religion nowadays doesn't have much to say in this area. Then there are the policy problems. How do you run the society? Which economics are better, the left or the right? How do you stop global warming? Now, you have Christians on both sides, and they are going to use the power of interpretation to justify their biases. And so religion will not have a viable voice in this era, in post-enlightenment, post-Christian society. And then comes the identity problems. Who are we? How do you divide the world between us and them? Sorry for the typo. Who should be helped? Who should be blessed? Who should be cured? And who should be ignored? Who should be cursed and bombed? Who goes to heaven? Who goes to hell? And the problem is that in the world in which you and I live, people don't see the religion as a solution. They see it as a problem. And so, if you concentrate on the dogmatic aspects, A, it's not according to the New Testament understanding, and B, according to the society in which we live, it's not going to help you. It's, become, it's going to become a problem. Look at the Trinity in Adventism. In the first period, what will be the attitude towards the Trinity? It's not important. Or it might be even suspicious. Because who came up with the Trinity? Sunday keeping, infant baptizing, immortal soul believing, pork eating. Catholic Church in the third or fourth century. But we don't care because our job is to preach the testing truth. And then comes 1888. And if we are saved by righteousness of Christ, you better know who is your savior. In 1890, Ellen G. White publishes The Desire of Ages and says, in Christ there was life, original, unborrowed, underived. You better know who is your savior. 1928, Leroy Edwin Froome publishes The Coming of the Comforter. You have to know something about the Trinity. A proper understanding of Trinity is needed for a proper understanding of soteriology, the process of salvation. You get confused on that one, and your soteriology will be confused. But you come to today's world, and if you ask people in the UK, in Netherlands, in Sweden, what's the most important for you? You know what's going to come at the top? My family. 
relationships. Now you ask them, how much time do you spend with your family? And we are all struggling to put the ideal into the practice. But people say, the relationships are the most important for me. And if the essence of ultimate reality is relationships, if God exists in community as a Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to say with Mardokius, is it possible that Adventism has come to kingdom for times like this? In 19th century mindset, the idea was that global domination will bring global liberation. T. He explained it yesterday. The idea of remnant brought the circles of those who are not enlightened. If you have not watched the BBC document by Jeremy Paxman, Doing Good, five series, the fifth one is the best. What was the good that the British Empire brought and what was the downside? It's worth watching on YouTube. Adventism in 19th century, if only we preach our understanding of the truth around the global world, then the world will be revelated, Jesus will come, and we all go to heaven. You and I live in a world with the contemporary pro world brings global problems that cannot be solved with local thinking. Remember San Antonio? Remember the clip where Mr. Bean is overseeing the exam? Remember that? And when the last moment comes, he says, and those of you who answered the question on geometry, pass your exam papers to the right, and those who answered the question on algebra, pass it to the left. And Mr. Bean discovers, uh, actually, I was answering the wrong question. In San Antonio, we ask the question, do you trust that your brothers and sisters in different parts of the world can come up with a solution that is good for them? Do you trust that the Holy Spirit leads your brothers and sisters in the community of faith to make a decision which is good for their part of the world? And you know what happened? Most people answered the question, in your understanding of Bible and spirit of prophecy, is it right to ordain women? Now, we have discussed that in Indianapolis, 1990, in Utrecht, 95. And we decided that in the body of Christ, the answer is no, we don't trust. We know better than them. Have you heard that before? Yeah. We need to go to those far-flung lands and help those savages to bring culture to them. But in 21st century, you face a world with global problems which cannot be solved with local thinking. To solve global problems, you need a global community. And here's the question. Where do you find that global community? You are not going to find the global community unless you espouse your values of truth, compassion, equality, freedom, courage, and responsibility. And not only espouse them and consider them important, but you need to radically pursue them. In other words, if the evidence base shows that what you believed is not true, then you are willing to do the rethinking. Now, where do you find a community like that? Now, remember there was a time when Adventists said, we don't care that people were eating ham and eggs for breakfast for centuries. From next week, we are eating cornflakes. And Kellogg says, and we'll put yogurt from the top and from the bottom, because you need to be squeaky clean. There was a time where Adventists said, 
We don't care that the clergyman for centuries were saying at a funeral, and don't cry, your mother is already singing in the heavenly choir. They said, nope, she's sleeping in the tomb. There was a time where Adventists said, it doesn't matter that the world, that Christians kept Sunday for 1900 years from next week. We are keeping Saturday. Why? Because they saw themselves as a rethinking movement. If they discover the truth, they are going to change the world. Now imagine, those health specialists tell you that every cigarette shortens your life by six minutes. Just imagine that tomorrow science discovers a cigarette that adds six minutes to your life. Adventists will be in the forefront of all Christians having start smoking seminars. True? Because we are rethinking movement. We are not only espousing the values, we are radically pursuing them. And we say, oh, we don't care that we are known for stop smoking seminars. Now we are going to have start smoking seminars. Why? Because truth is more important to us than our tradition. Compassion. Equality. We are willing to rethink our policies, our theology. If what we understand in 2019 is better than what we understood in 1950. Freedom. Courage. Arthur just told you a story from the compulsory military service. I lived for 30 years under that system. I had to spend two years in the military service. All university students spent one year, but theology students had to do two years. Because under communism, all are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> are you willing to redefine your identity in light of your values? Because let me tell you, in, six, in February 2017, after the earthquake of uh, Donald Trump being elected the US president, Mark Zuckerberg published an audacious manifesto on the need to build a global community, and Facebook is going to be the leaders in it. He explained that the social and political upheavals of our time from rampant drug addiction to murderous totalitarian regimes result to a large extent from the disintegration of human communities. He lamented the fact that for decades membership in all kinds of groups has declined as much as one quarter. And that's why a lot of people now need to find a sense of purpose and support somewhere else. And he says Facebook is going to help one billion people to join meaningful communities. And if we at Facebook can do this, this will not only turn around the whole decline in community membership we have seen for decades, it will start to strengthen our social fabric and bring the world closer together. I don't know why Mark Zuckerberg is in what he does. But here is a guy who says, I am going to rethink my identity, my purpose of existence, and the whole empire of Facebook based on the fact and values that I see in contemporary society. And he vowed to change Facebook's whole mission to take this on. Imagine! He believes that this is important. So let me conclude. All new events, new patterns of thinking will always cause a crisis of faith. There's always a new perspective that you have not seen before. And it creates the identity crisis. It's the nature of the game. That's how it happened in history. You cannot retreat back. The only viable solution is to go forward, to rethink your faith and identity. You cannot fight penicillin. You may go to your grave thinking that penicillin is devil's invention to take away your prayer life, but your children are not going to believe it, and your grandchildren are going to laugh at it. 
But you can rethink your faith and say, thank you, Jesus, that you gave people the capacity to understand how my body works so that penicillin can heal you. Adventism started as a rethinking movement, which was the rethinking of Millerism, which was the rethinking of Deism, which was the rethinking of Enlightenment, which was the rethinking of medieval European thought. Every rethinking moves you forward, and every rethinking creates some mess. If you want to for go forward, you have to do periodically your rethinking. Here's the good news. Adventism had to do rethinking a few times in its history. And every time it came to the verge of a crisis, so far, it managed to do it well. Here's the question. If we are willing to do a rethinking, then as Arthur ended, the best days of Adventism in Europe are still ahead of us. If we are here to perpetuate the views of the pioneers, we are going to travel the road that established churches traveled ahead of us. At the end are empty cathedrals and full cemeteries. What is the solution? A biblical understanding of community. Participating in what the Trinity is doing. Is it possible that God would have a community of justice in a world of economic and ecological injustice? Is it possible that God could have a community of generosity and simplicity? Of people who can say, enough, I don't need more. In a consumer world? Is it possible to have a community of selfless giving in a world of selfishness? Is it possible to have a community of being humble and bold and courageous about the truth in a world which says everything is relative? Is it possible to have a community which brings hope in a world of disillusionment and consumer satiation? Is it possible to have a community of joy and thanksgiving in a world which emphasizes the entitlement? And back to Sigve's book and contribution. Is it possible to have a community that experiences God's presence in a world which says all days are equal? There is nothing transcendent, nothing special in any other day. Imagine. What if God had a community like that? Then the best days of Adventism are ahead of us. Um, you talked much about how community will be the new way of uh, doing rethinking church. How does that relate to the three angels' messages that was like the core of Adventism? Ask Sigve Tonstad. He will, give a, he will give you a better answer than me. I mean, it's full of community. Just read it in the context. Where the abuse of power of the beast and the false trinity is rampant in the society because in order to achieve a unity in the society, you have to use the power. Three angels' message says, God is going to win the war by not using the power, by showing his character. No other religion will give you that. It's a new way of community. Why did he bring them out of Egypt? Because you will be an alternative community. In a system where the harder the slaves work, the richer the Pharaoh gives, gets. And so it was all about the community through the story. But talk to Sigve, he will give you a better answer. Thank you very much, Daniel. Over breakfast, we were discussing, amongst other things, uh, whether a church can be a church or a movement? Can it be either or both? What's your view? It depends how you define it. I mean, we'll hear tomorrow from Wagner and Arthur. How can we preserve the values of a movement? Adventism always prided itself. We are not an established church. We have movement. We are always willing to move forward. The tragedy is when Adventism as a rethinking movement 
collided with salvation. Because from now on, you have to be an Adventist to be saved. From now on, you have to do it the way I tell you, because otherwise you are interfering with the process of salvation. Those people that give you trouble there in Scotland, they mean well. Because if you are changing something, you are in the danger of not being saved. So get out of the business of salvation and be a rethinking movement. And then there is a future. God has a monopoly of salvation. You and I don't decide who is going to be saved. And yes, if we are willing to be a movement, a rethinking movement, reimagining, as I put it, and I don't want it to create the impression it's just a cerebral, no, it's reimagining, then you can be a movement. Dr. Sigurd Tunstall. Thank you for a very, very interesting <coughs> presentation. I, uh, I just wonder, you represent Adventist history, a first period of eschatology until 1888, and then a period of soteriology until 1957, and then fragmentation. And I think it's quite easy to, to agree with that representation. But then you try to put Ellen G. White into it. Is her theological project, is it eschatology? Is it soteriology? I would say it is neither of those. The cosmic conflict story in Ellen G. White is theodicy. You know, it is, and it is a project that is not reflected as much in, you know, the Ellen G. White is kind of on the side of these other movements. You know, she participates, but she is, she is uh, really quite distinctive. So, I, I just, We'll put that out there and wonder what you would say in comment to that. So, in 1755, there is the Lisbon earthquake. And the Lisbon earthquake is not the world's greatest earthquake, but it is the earthquake that changed thinking the most. Even the last 10 years, uh, three big academic books have been written about the Lisbon earthquake. And uh, some of you may have read Voltaire, Candid, you know, his book Candid was written in response to the Lisbon earthquake. Right. You know, it changed the way people were thinking. When Mil you know, Miller and Adventists talk about the Lisbon earthquake, they think about it as a sign of the soon coming of Jesus. When the world at large thinks about the Lisbon earthquake, they think about an event that proves that there is no God and there is certainly no soon coming of Jesus. So. The problem of the Odyssey began in, in earnest with the Lisbon earthquake, and it became worse with the Holocaust and Hiroshima, you know. And Ellen G. White, as I'm suggesting, has a the Odyssey project, a theological the Odyssey project, that in some ways seems to me to have sailed as a kind of, you know, in some ways a little bit homeless in a world where there is a demand for a the Odyssey. 1755, the Holocaust, and, and so on. I just wonder how we could sort of make this work for us in, in a voice in our community that seems in some ways to, to be just right on target for the type of world in which we live. One of the consequences of enlightenment was the reduction of salvation to a transaction between God and man. And seeing the cosmic dimension of what God is doing was lost on a or classical Christianity. And while Adventism did an amazing rethinking of eschatology in the 19th century, other parts of theology were still left to, to, to do the rethinking. And yesterday, uh, Tihi showed beautifully how the rethinking of ecclesiology needs to be done and the rethinking of theodicy. I mean, Ellen G. White helped us greatly. But she saw her contribution, you know, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 3, to encourage, to exhort, and to build up. And it's up to theologians to do the theological groundwork. Yeah. For everybody who wants to get a little bit challenged, read Sigve's dissertation, Saving God's Reputation. You will have the contribution, theological contribution there. So yes, I agree with what you say. 
After 1888, Adventism discovers that we need to do rethinking of soteriology and that somebody already did some work be ahead of us, that God blessed the reformers. Now, did they say the last word? You heard yesterday, Jan Barna. I mean, 100 years after Luther, Wesley comes and understands, if, you, if Christ is your justification and sanctification and glorification, the result will be cheap grace. There will be no discipleship. And Wesley comes and says, no, after the first work of grace comes the second work of grace. Sanctification is equally important. And so you need to rethink your soteriology. And definitely you need to rethink your theodicy. And even after 1915 when she died. Yeah.